What better way to end this month on a strong note than with a talk by a lifetime advocate of women leaders and entrepreneurs? I've heard Denise speak last October at the Grace Hopper conference. I loved her workshop on leadership and communication and her actionable and practical advice. Here's one example. She told us, here's what you will stop doing, pining, whining, talking about weather, traffic, and how busy you are. Even in a coffee line, coffee line, talk about something meaningful, she said. It made me realize how often we waste an opportunity for a deep connection. Denise has a long history of advocacy for women leaders. She started a nonprofit to help women entrepreneurs. She founded the Thought Leadership Lab, where she coaches executive, executives, entrepreneurs, and leaders of Fortune 500 companies. She co-founded Springboard, a conference for women entrepreneurs. And last but not least, she wrote a book, Ready to be a Thought Leader, which she will discuss today. This talk is brought to you in collaboration with Talks at Google and Corp and Women at Google. Many thanks also to those who helped to make this event happen, especially to Regina Manzana Sony. Without further ado, the floor is yours, Denise. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here, actually for three reasons. First, because it's Women's History Month, and we're celebrating our four mothers and our four sisters, who are really the people who built the path that got us here where we are today. Secondly, because I'm really honored to reconnect with all the folks that I met at Grace Hopper. How many of you guys go to Grace Hopper conferences? It's such a fun place where so many wonderful women in tech come together for the first time, many of them. And third, because we're launching a women's community. And honestly, my whole career has been about women's communities. I belong to them, I start them, I'm kind of a groupie. So <laughs> how did that begin? I really wanted to share some of that story. The truth is, many years ago, in the early part of my career, I had the chance to take a class on creativity in business. And one of the things that they asked us to do was an exercise to write our life mission. Now honestly, I never thought of doing such a thing. I thought that's what companies did. And it took me weeks and weeks of iterating before I came up with a mission statement that I could live my life by. And I want to share it with you. My mission, more women leaders at the top of every organization. How many of you guys believe that's a mission worth accomplishing? Yeah. So that's what I, why I do what I do, is I really work to that mission statement. And what I want to talk about today is some of the paths that I've taken to get here, as well as some of the techniques that I've learned and some of the things that I've learned from so many other amazing people, my role models, the people within this community of technology, but also across the United States and across the world. So let's get started. I want to start with a survey. So take a minute and look at all the choices. I'm not sure what a thought leader is. I, don't wa I want to be a thought leader, but I don't, I don't know how. I've identified goals that will help me build a followership for my ideas. Becoming a thought leader is just not my top priority right now, or others already call me a thought leader. So let's have a quick show of hands. How many are A? I'm not sure what a thought leader is. Yeah, admit it, right? Not really entirely sure. That word gets bandied around a lot, so we're going to kind of define it, at least in the way that I believe it should be defined. How many, I want to be a thought leader, but I really don't know how. OK, good, because we're going to go through a lot of steps today. That's excellent. OK, I have identified goals that help me already build a followership for my ideas. How many people are in that category? Great, a couple of great folks here. Becoming a thought leader is not my top priority right now. It's OK to admit that. Maybe you have other things on your to-do list. But nobody in this room has that. Great, all right. And last, <laughs> others already call me a thought leader. I've already been defined that way. Not quite yet. All right, good. Well, that gives me a sense of where we are, because I want to spend some time on both the definition and the how-to steps, because I think it's really critical to think about what can we do to move on that journey from leader to thought leader? What does it take? But let's start with a couple of examples of folks that I admire, thought leaders that I admire, including the two co-founders of Woe Grammar. So these two women working in the tech industry, they kept getting the same question over and over. And it was always said with a bit of trepidation, like, What's it really like to work in tech? Sort of thinking that maybe there was going to be some bad answer because of something they'd read in the media. And these two women felt like, that's not right. Our careers are going well. 
Women programmers have great careers in technology, and we want to share that story. So they started interviewing women. First a few, then dozens, then hundreds, and now they're out speaking those stories in, lots of big, in front of lots of big audiences. They built a website where they share their stories, and now they're working on a book. To me, that is building a followership for your ideas and changing the conversation. Next is a guy, Ron Finley. He calls himself the Gorilla Gardener. How many of you guys have heard of Ron? He's got a wonderful TED Talk, well worth listening to. So he is an artist. He lives in South Central Los Angeles. And one day, he built a garden in his front yard. He just planted a garden. Now, that's all well and good, except for the city owned that land. And so within a few months after his garden started to grow, he got a letter. And it said, tear out your garden. And he thought, this is just wrong. So he started a petition, and he got hundreds and then thousands of signatures, and he took it down to City Hall, and he demanded a change. And that change has actually instituted an entire movement around community gardens in South Central, and access to fresh food in a place where it's just strip mall after strip mall. And he started to spread those ideas to other urban communities so that homeless shelters are building gardens, and they're taking the abandoned lots and turning them into something useful. And third, is my client, Von Tung Quinlevin. Von is passionate about education and access to great jobs for people from disadvantaged communities and, from veteran, and veterans who returned to the United States after being away at war. And she started a program at PG&E, a 100-year-old utility company, to give access for the first time to those folks for high-paying jobs, and then spread that effort across her entire industry and started to spread it across the United States. And I'll be telling you more about her story, because she's actually one of the reasons that I wrote this book, was my work with her. She really inspired me to share what I learned from my ex experience with her. All right, so what is a thought leader? You've heard all of that. Let me try to distill it. It starts, I think, by thought leaders start by being change agents. They've got something that they're doing that's different than what's already been done or always been done. And they inspire us with that change. They inspire a few folks around them. And then they recognize that this innovation is something worth spreading. They understand they need to replicate and scale that, because they themselves can't do that alone. They understand that they need to start building followers in order to build sustainable change. So thought leadership is about starting as a change agent, which is why I think this is such a powerful conversation for folks here at Google because so many of you are creating unbelievable innovations. So now, how about sharing those in a way that those ideas can be broadened, those innovations can become sustainable change? When you think about our foremothers that are showcased in all the walls around and those who are not here in the room, we've got posters of all kinds of amazing women who were celebrating here on Women's History Month. They all replicated their change beyond one small place to something that had a bigger impact. Making an impact often starts, though, locally. It starts in one company, one organization, one city, one school. And then it starts to grow from there through the efforts of often one or a small team of individuals. And it starts to have, potentially, the chance to bank a movement. It is actually the art of building a followership for our ideas and for the change that we have underway. That, to me, is true thought leadership. It's not tweeting what you had for lunch. Okay, I know. That, that used to be the old way. Set up a Twitter account. I'm a thought leader. Like, no, not so much. So I'm trying to reclaim this word, thought leader, because I really do believe it's something much bigger and something to really be proud of when you get that moniker. So let me tell you a little story about how I came to this conversation. The truth is I'm an accidental thought leader. I had no plan to be a thought leader. I had no idea about being a thought leader, but I did work in the technology industry for a number of years and co-founded an organization called the Forum for Women Entrepreneurs. For those here in Silicon Valley, you may know it now as Watermark. But the organization was originally started around one idea. And that number one is where it started. Less than 1% of the venture capital funding in the United States was going to women entrepreneurs. I don't know about you, but I thought 50% was fair. <laughs> 1% seemed astonishing. And my co-founder, that's her there on the screen, Jennifer Gill Roberts, she called me up one day and she said, we need to do something about this. And she was absolutely right. And we created this organization to offer three things. Education, 
how do you do this? How do you do a venture-funded, scalable business in technology and life science? How do you access all the resource providers, the law firms, the banks, the accounting firms? And then third, how do you connect women with others who are their role models, those who have come before, so that they can help one another? So to arm in arm, we can do this together. So we created that organization. I was doing it full time, excuse me, I was working full time doing it on the side until I quit to run the organization after five years. We had about 300 members and we started scaling to other cities. It was a lot of work, a lot of fun, and one day the phone rang. So imagine I'm just working away on my own little, little organization. I get a call from some group called the National Women's Business Council. I'd never heard of them. But they were working at the national level on similar issues of women and access to capital. And they called and they said, we want to host the first venture conference for women entrepreneurs. You guys call them Google Demo Days, right? I attended the Google Demo Day here a few week, uh, months ago for women. This was the precursor to that. In fact, it was the first venture conference in the United States for women entrepreneurs, where we not only put them on stage, but we coached them and got them ready for prime time. That eventually became Springboard. And that first conference that we ran here in 2000, we had 357 applicants. We chose 27 women. Within three months, 25 of those companies got funded. People told us that was impossible. They told us, first of all, there were no women out there. Who are we, who are we to think we could put on a conference of all women entrepreneurs? But we proved them wrong. And we went on to scale that effort across the United States and now internationally. But here's what was so fascinating, because doing that gave me this whole different opportunity to shape the conversation about women's entrepreneurship. I suddenly started getting calls from the media. I got a chance to go speak at conferences nationally and even internationally. I got a chance to serve on committees and commissions working on these issues. I got a bully pulpit around an issue that I cared about deeply. And I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> I mean, I'll be serious. It's like I had to quickly get media training. I had to learn how to tell our story and tell our message more broadly because I had this chance. So great. Springboard continues to scale. We are all over, as I said, the world. We've helped companies like Zipcar and Constant Contact. That's the day we went to NASDAQ and took Constant Contact public on the NASDAQ. It was an amazing high for all of us involved. Who would have ever thought that that would happen? And it, the organization now continues to do its work. And fast forward a few years, I'm off doing other things, and I get a phone call from this, this woman, Vaughn Tone Quinlivan, who I mentioned earlier. Vaughn called me and she said, so you know, Denise, you became a thought leader in women's entrepreneurship. I want to do that. Honestly, I'm looking at the phone going, I was a thought leader. <laughs> I didn't know I was a thought leader. That wasn't a word I'd use for myself. Often it's somebody else who first gives you that moniker. And she said, I want to do that. And we sat down in her living room and we wrote a plan. It was a five-year plan from nobody to, to well-recognized thought leader. And then she hired me to help her do it. And over the next three years, she knocked it out of the park. She went from creating a program internally to her company called Power Pathway, which was a community college workforce development program, which brought the community together, the community colleges together, and the company together to actually train people to get jobs in PG&E. But then she spread that across her industry. She started serving on committees and commissions, testifying in front of the US Senate, recognized by the White House, and then headhunted by the governor to do the same work that she did at PG&E across the entire community college system as the vice chancellor of workforce. That was such a wake up call for both of us. Honestly, I never knew that you could do this with a plan. And that's really why I wrote my book. I honestly wrote this book for my younger self. I mean, I wrote the book that I wish I'd had back when I first had this sort of moment because there was no book back then. And I want to give that same seven step process to all the others who want to follow in hers and all these other women's and men's footsteps. So I want to talk about some of those steps today. And how do you do that? Because thought leadership gives you a platform to change the world. How many of us would like to change just a little part of the world? Just a little bit, right? That's probably why we're working here, right? This is a place where you can get to change the world. So why do you want to be a thought leader? I want to invite you, since we're creating community, to actually interact with someone you haven't met before, or someone who I call your GC partner, geographically convenient. <laughs> 
I want you to answer this question with someone. You know, 30 seconds each. And those who are on the phone or sitting at their desks, write it down. Why do you want to be a thought leader? Here's some things people tell me. They tell me that they want more influence, they want more impact, they want more income, and they want to leave a legacy. So which is it for you? Or is it something completely different that I haven't even thought of? So turn to your GC partner and just share for a few seconds, why do you want to do this? What would make it worthwhile for you? Go ahead. <laughs> the hardest part when I ask a question like this people get so engaged but how many of you guys influence I really need more influence a few folks have that one up okay I like that okay how about impact I want to have more impact the room goes up in flames here right yes this is what I want how many would not mind having a little more income okay all right but pretty much most of the room on that one and how many would like to leave a legacy not just do a job but leave something behind that matters and then this is the one that I found was so fascinating. It's also career insurance. We got health insurance and life insurance. What about career insurance? People love to hire thought leaders. People love to work for thought leaders. People love to promote thought leaders. So this, to me, having your ideas out and a followership for what you believe in, this brings all kinds of opportunities. Honestly, when I hear some of the people that I know who come to Google, they've come because they've built a followership and they've gotten hired in because of that following. So career insurance, what a great reason to do anything. So how does it begin? I believe it begins by finding our passion. Some of us, our passion is what we get to do every single day. Some of us, it's in our community. Some of us, it's much more broad. Some of, it's, some of it, sometimes it's really tiny. I just want to change one thing in my kid's school. But how do you figure that out? How do you find that, that intersection of where you're going to play? So I came up with this diagram. We've all started it. How many of you did the Venn diagram, fifth grade, fourth grade, right? Those three overlapping circles. I believe that this is the key to figuring this out. So it starts with where you have credibility. Often. It's where you have some degrees, you have some credentials, maybe you've won an award, you have a, you're part of a company or a team that's doing interesting work in an area. Or it could be based on the fact that you've had people whose lives you've changed. Next circle is experience. This could be the number of years of experience or successful change agents. You've made some successful change. That's experience. You've managed a major initiative or even just starting out. That's something that you want to be out talking about. And finally, commitment. You are committed to improving something. You're committed to enabling your team to be more effective. There's lots of different ways in which this one comes into play. But if we start there and then find where the others overlap, I find that that's where people can most likely come up with what I call their thought leadership intersection point, that place where all three of the circles intersect. This is critical because we can't be known for everything. We can't be known for being all over the place. We have to find something, a niche, one place to play, to be that go-to person. So this is where it begins. And I want to ask you this question. What is one thing you're really passionate about? I'm sure this room is full of people who are passionate about a lot of amazing things. So why don't you turn back to your GC partner and just share one thing in one sentence or less, one thing you're passionate about. And it doesn't have to be related to your day job. I just want to give you permission to be thinking bigger than that. <laughs> OK, one thing, share with the person next to you. Here's 
the thing about this conversation. Remember doing Ella's introduction and she said that one thing she learned is that we waste a lot of time talking about traffic and all the things that we're too busy doing. To me, if this was the question we were asking each other standing in line for coffee, wouldn't that shift our entire day? Wouldn't it shift the entire community if this is what we talked about all the time? whether it be with our family members, whether it be with our friends, whether it be with our colleagues. So I talked to Sue, just gonna pick on you here. <laughs> I'm guessing that one of the things you're passionate about is women's leadership. Yes. Because Sue leads the women's leadership network here within Google. One of the few companies I have ever heard of that actually has a full-time person devoted to running their women's network. I think that's fabulous. And to get to align what you're passionate about with your day job, that's pretty fabulous. Okay, what else? Who else is passionate about something that they're willing to share? Be brave now. Yes? Um, I'm quite passionate about helping other people be successful. Helping other people be successful. I'm not very good at helping myself. Oh, yes. <laughs> We're always really good at the others, right? She said that she's not very good at helping herself, but she's really good at helping other people. That's something to really be passionate about. And being able to see them shine and see them succeed, that's really wonderful, isn't it? What else? One more idea. One more something somebody's passionate about. Yes? Um, for me, it's access to good food. Um, so there's a nonprofit. So Autumn is really passionate about great food. I'm going to say this so the people online can hear. And she works with a, a, com a community organization that goes into backyards, picks the fruit, and redistributes it so that it doesn't go to waste and people can get out in the fresh air. I'm ready to sign up. <laughs> right? <laughs> so this to me is where it begins, right? If we can find that one piece we're passionate about. So I want you to start thinking about this today. If it, nothing came to mind immediately, this is where the conversation starts. The second is to find your imperative. I'm going to sh share Katie Orenstein is one of the people I interviewed for my book. Katie is a former journalist who is really on a roll across the United States to create women empowered to write op-eds. Why is that? What she realized is she did some research. 37% of the content contributed to news outlets. Only 37% is women. Only 15% of the editors on Wikipedia are women. Only 26% of the Sunday morning news shows are women. And she believed that part of it was a challenge with being able to shape an argument, being able to frame the the conversation in a way that showcased new ideas without discounting the old. And so she created a, a program called the Op-Ed Project, the opedproject.org, and she goes around the country offering op-ed seminars, one-day sessions. I've gone twice over the five years that I've known about it, and spend a Saturday and really learn how to frame an argument because that is critical for everything whether it be getting up in your own company to articulate your ideas, whether it be getting on a big stage, whether it be writing an op-ed for the New York Times. It takes shaping an argument in a way, as I said, that doesn't discount others. And that's what she's really passionate about. Because her belief is that if we shape the conversations, we shape regulations, we shape policy, and we shape the way we're treated by the culture that we live in. That's her imperative. So thinking to yourself, what if for you, Here's what I mean by that. If we have a vision of the future that we can see, what if it looked like this? And we can articulate that for others? That's when we can get people to follow us. So here's what I recognize. When I started the Forum for Women Entrepreneurs oh so many years ago, we had that, com that conversation with people. What if women had 50% of the venture capital funding in the United States? I hate to say how many years later it is, then we're somewhere between 6 and 11%, depending on what year it is. We've been at this for a long time. The what-if future could be very far off. But you want to imagine a future and envision a future and articulate a future because then others will get on board and create that future with you. That's what it takes. We can't do any of this alone. So that question of what if, what is the better future that you envision? Write that one down as something to go ahead and think about when you get home tonight. Can I articulate it clearly? Can I tell others what I want to change in the world? That's a really important question to be asking ourselves or asking our friends. OK, another quick survey. What, if anything, is holding you back from becoming a thought leader? 
Now you know a little bit about what it is. We're starting to talk about some of the steps, and we're going to talk about some more. But I'm too busy. I don't have time. I don't have the appropriate skill set. Give me a few years. I'm ha I have some good ideas, but sometimes I lack confidence. Or nothing. I'm on my way. So let's see. Show of hands. Number one, I'm too busy. Couple, few, OK? Number two, I don't have the appropriate skill set. Not quite ready yet. Give me a few years, OK? Number three, I'm, I have some good ideas, but sometimes I lack confidence. Yeah, that one I see a lot, absolutely. <laughs> or nothing, I'm on my way. OK, we've got a few folks in the front of the room who sat front and center. <laughs> what does that tell you about that front row? Next time, you're going to sit in the front row because you'll be able to say yes to that. Here's what's been fascinating. I've been around the country talking about these issues and these ideas. I've been around the country to communities of men, women, old, young, every kind of background and culture. And what I keep finding is the same story, the same things that are holding everyone back. I'm beginning to wonder who got the memo that says it's OK. Because nobody I've met has got the memo. It's either their company, their boss, their culture, their family, some sort of a religious norm, whatever. There's so many reasons why we don't do this. There's so many things that hold us back. And I get that. In fact, I added a whole chapter in the center of my book because I realized how important this conversation of what I call putting your eye, the letter I, putting your eye on the line. So everyone I interviewed for the book, I asked them, like, what do you do? How do you keep going? How do you stay focused on this as a priority for you? And I put together what I call the rules for resilience. And I came up with one image that I think sort of tells the story. And this is it. <laughs> because how many days do we get up in the morning and we look in the mirror and we see the lion? And we think we can do anything. We're invincible. And how many times do we get in, up in the morning and we see the little kitty that's even smaller than ourselves? Because there's what I call, or is what my client calls, the itty bitty shitty committee. <laughs> right? It's in our head. It's very loud. Anybody have one of those? <laughs> right, I, we all admit that we have one. Those negative voices, they tell us we can't do this, we can't do this, for whatever reason. So how do we fire the itty bitty shitty committee? How do we move beyond those conversations from our family or our background that say, don't get too big for your britches, or don't be a show off, or whatever it is that we're telling ourselves? So just think to yourself and share with the person next to you, how do you nurture your inner lion? What's one thing you do? Some people it's music, some people it's colleagues, some people it's getting out and doing exercise. But just share with the person next to you what's one thing you do to build your courage, to feel invincible, to feel like anything is possible. OK? Match up with somebody. What is one thing? <laughs> I hear just a few folks. Who has something? Let's, let's hear those little secrets. What is it that you do to nurture that sense of confidence? What's a couple of things? There must be some great ideas in this room. I believe it. Coming to this talk. Coming to this talk. <laughs> Thank you. That's very sweet, Ella. And how many of you watch TED Talks? Right? I really I love to watch TED Talks because they inspire me to think, Here's that person who came from nobody, came from nowhere, and look at this amazing thing that they're doing. What else are you trying? Auto-suggestion. Just tell yourself. That tell you yourself. The positive voice instead of the negative voice. So it's that, uh, that mantra, that repeating, I can do anything. I am amazing. Wouldn't that be a, but a wonderful thing to wake up to? Yes? Um, reminding yourself of like, the amazing things you have done. Yes, like, remind like, yourself the past. What have I, what's the journey I've already been on? What have I already overcome to get where I am today? Because if I could do that, I can do anything. That's what's so fun about the Grace Hopper Conference. You know, I hit this room of 600 women, and I asked them, how many of them came from another part of the world? And like 80% of them raised their hand. How many of you are doing a business in a language that's not your first language? You know, 75%. And I think, you can do that? The rest of this is easy. 
Honestly, that feels impossible to me. And yet, so many people have done that. So you're right, reminding ourselves of where we've been and what we've already overcome. So I want you to think about your own practices and actually maybe document them because there's days when you kind of need to remind yourself. It's one of those little kitty days. What can I do today to actually bring myself back to feeling confident? That's an important list to have handy. Put it on your smartphone so that you have that ready. OK, let's go on to step four here, because this was really the biggest awakening, the biggest learning for me when I was doing this book. I'm a startup girl. I started my first company when I was 26. I love the startup phase. I joined all kinds of startups. I insisted on being employee 13 or less, because I <laughs> love that first part, right, where there's nothing. It's all to get figured out. And then I started to talk to people who really were thought leaders in the world. And what I learned was that this was the essential step. You have to codify what you've done so others can follow in your footsteps. So one of the people I interviewed is actually someone here at Google. How many of you know Avinash? Right? So Avinash started his career at Intuit. He started working for the first time with search engine optimization tools, and he realized that they were really hard to implement. It was hard to get his company on board with the kinds of things he needed to do. So he spoke at a conference one day, and he started telling these experiences. And two guys came up to him at the end, and they said, you should write a blog on that. And when we were talking, when I interviewed him on the phone, he said, there was already thousands of blogs. Who was I to blog? So we tried a test. He just sent it out to maybe 10 or 12 or 13 different colleagues and his wife to see what people thought. Did he have anything to say? And he came to, up with a set of principles, one of which really resonated with me. And that is uncomplexify. Now, I know this is a made up word. But what he, well, the reason that he said this is that he recognized that the kinds of things that you guys are dealing with in technology or people in healthcare, or whatever field they're in, they are complicated. And we're not talking about dumbing down. We're talking about simplifying, getting rid of the jargon, getting rid of the acronyms. I worked at Motorola. I understand the world of acronyms. OK, but that's not how others can follow in your path. So we started blogging. And over time, he got a call from somebody at Wiley. And they said, what if we put your blogs into a book? And then he wrote a second book with more blog posts in it. Today, he has blog followers around the world and, of course, followers on social media from everywhere. But he tells me that the one thing he's most excited about from his experience is the love letters. <laughs> he gets love letters from all over the world. He said he gets love letters from young people when they're first stepping into their career. Thank you so much for giving me the path that I can follow for my career. Another a senior executive at a big company, a global company, saying thank you for being able to distill that because I was really having trouble understanding how I could get my team to get on board with that. Uncomplexify. It's a really key point. Another part of this codify your lessons learned is about models, frameworks. So my friend Robin Chase, the CEO, founder of Zipcar, she just came out with a new book called Peers Inc. And she created this cool model. I can't get into the whole details. But these are the kinds of things that people who want to go from leader to thought leader start to think about. It's showing the pathway. It's showing the path. How did I get here? What are the things I believe in? What's my credo? What's the framework? How can I do this? So when I was doing my own book, of course, and it was all about frameworks, I had to go out and hire somebody to create me a framework because I had no idea. Just to articulate my seven steps, we're covering a few of these today. And this is available on my website. But this is, to me, the steps that it takes. You're not going to always start in the same place. But that's part of what we're talking about. You want to articulate what are the steps that others can take to move forward. And then we're going to talk about being discoverable. Being discoverable is pretty important. And what was so fun when I was preparing this talk was to see the discoverable behavior of some of your colleagues. So being discoverable could be having a great LinkedIn profile. How many have a great LinkedIn profile? About a third of the room. OK, maybe half on a good day. OK, how many have put themselves forward for an award? Uh, one, two. So I just want to say, I got, I got nominated for an award. Um, organization contacted me. And they said, could you complete this form? And I, so I completed the form. And I sent it back, because I thought getting an award would be kind of fun. And the woman wrote back, and she said, that was remarkable. And I said, what do you mean? She said, a third of the people don't open the email past the first 
ta ta target line, and no one has ever gotten the form back in 24 hours. <laughs> I didn't think I was that strange, but this is what I'm talking about. If we don't put ourselves forward or co-nominate someone else, we're not going to be discoverable for our ideas. So here's a few people within your community who are, this is my friend Joyce Dickerson, who's on, out of town or would have been here today. She's from the Global Data Center on Sustainability, used to be at Stanford. And she was talking in an online forum about hosting a summit on how green is the internet. It's a great little video. I definitely recommend you go watch it because she talks about how that, that team has really done thought leadership around these ideas of sustainability. And then I found our very own Vidya, who will be speaking on the panel who is doing a fun little video about how to unleash the power of Chrome kiosk apps. And I found Joanna Smith from the Android team, who's on Medium telling people about how, developers about how to use the Google tools to create great interfaces. And I found internationally your Google Nigeria country manager, who is hosting a wonderful panel program similar to this, showcasing women leaders in, in her country and being able to share that with the Google community. So this is another question I want to leave you to think about. How will you be more discoverable this year? What is one thing you can do to get your ideas out there? I'm going to give you three possible things that you wouldn't have thought about in how to answer this question. Starting here with convening. So one of the powerful ways that Vaughn really changed things in her industry is she convened a consortium across her industry. How did we do that? The idea was to find all the people with her same job title in other companies in the utility industry and invite them to join her in a quarterly gathering. She found a host, excuse me, a, a, a head of the group, and she was the co-head. The head of the group was a guy that was well-respected and well-known. She was completely unknown in the community. So as the co-chair of the, the consortium, she had a chance to draft the agenda to make sure her agenda got discussed at every meeting. Convening is a very powerful strategy for thought leaders. Bringing people together to share best practices, but also sharing your own sharing what you're struggling with and learning from other people, but also teaching other people. Second strategy, I couldn't go without talking about Cheryl. <laughs> when people ask, and outside the, United, outside the uh, Bay Area, when I ask people what's one thought leader they, they think of, this is the first person that comes to mind. But what I think is unique about what she's done, is she went from a talk to a book to building a community empowering people to start their own communities. So think about yourselves this year. She has actually created this possibility for women who are really excited and passionate about women's leadership to create Google, excuse me, Google, create lean in circles. How many of them are within Google right now? How many of you guys have been to a, you have some here, right? The one in Palo Alto I think is like 700 people now. I got to speak for them a couple years ago. I was like 700 people, they don't all come. Yes. Okay, <laughs> it's a little scary. But maybe 50 or 60 come to each session and we have a chance to discuss the things that, that, that Cheryl's really advocating about how to lean in. And last, I want to have a little exercise here on my third strategy, which I call Amplify. And I wanna actually get you all out of your chairs for a few minutes and playing with me. So let me explain how this is gonna work. You're all gonna match up in groups of three. And you're going to each have a separate role. Role number one is the interviewer. And the interviewer has a microphone. You see my microphone, right? And you're going to interview the other person. You're always going to say the same question. Tell me one thing about yourself that you really like. Or what's your superpower, if you prefer? The second person is the interviewee. And they are going to answer the question. The third person is the amplifier. Let me show a little bit about how that might work. So let's say that the person says, I'm really brave. That's the attribute I'm most proud of about myself. So how might you amplify that? So I'm gonna make this up. So let's say Sue says, I'm really brave. Because you're really brave, Sue, aren't you? Sue is not just brave. Sue is the bravest woman I know. She climbed Annapurna last year. 
she goes and jumps out of airplanes. <laughs> Not only that, but she organizes events that bring together thousands of women to change the world. She's brave every day for her daughter. She's brave every day for her team. Now, I've only met Sue for five minutes. I have no idea if she does any of those things. <laughs> You're making it up. This is for fun, OK? And how long do you go? How long does this last? Go as long as you can, plus 20 seconds. This is supposed to take you out of your comfort zone, and I'll explain why you're doing this. But after the first person, you can go on to the second and then the third. You've got maybe a, just a few minutes to do this, because I want to leave some time for questions at the end. But everybody rotates, everybody plays each role. And the last thing is, when I ask you for one superpower or attribute, I do not mean your cute shoes or your cool glasses. <laughs> this means an attribute, something that you do that you're really proud of. And the first thing that came to mind is not the one you dismiss right now. That was the committee showing up. No, whatever you thought, I'm proud of this attribute. That's the one you say. All right, everybody up. Matching to threes. Nobody gets to not play. Question, how many of you like the people that were in your group a whole lot better than you did a few minutes ago? <laughs> what is that about? What is that about? You. Right, they just said nice things about you. How much of this behavior is going on in our day-to-day -day lives? I'm kind of on a roll around as many audiences as I can to get more of this amplifying behavior. Not everyone is going to be on the front of the stage. Not everyone is going to be the thought leader tomorrow. But all of us can amplify. All of us can amplify each other. And this kind of behavior just is so reinforcing. It gets us to want to come to work in the morning if somebody's actually paying attention. Now, by the way, those people were making that stuff up. What if? Somebody was amplifying something you were actually doing, something you're actually good at. That, to me, is the counterbalance to the committee. It's the, that's the idea that if our culture, we were talking during the break about how often if we come from another place, that's a place that was told, we were told that's not, you don't put yourself forward. So we need others sometimes to find that little secret passion, that little expertise that we see, but we discount. And we want people to be amplifying that. So you can be amplifying that for each other. That's something I really wish for your community, to have much more of the, like nominate someone else for an award. Put someone else forward to be on a panel or be on a panel with someone for the first time if they've never done it. Help somebody to think through what they're passionate about. I was talking during the break as well about how people said, well, how do I do this? I, I don't know what my, I don't know how to do that pen your van exercise. So I will share with you some worksheets that I have, but let me just cover this last couple questions. And first, this is really the, the ultimate question. How will you support each other this year? How could you create little communities of folks who want to take the first steps on the thought leadership path? How could you potentially use a lean and circle model to come together on a, on a weekly, monthly, or quarterly basis to actually amplify one another and invite and empower each other to move forward in this conversation. Because to me, thought leadership is not about being known. It is about being known for making a difference. So my invitation every time I give this talk is to say, what do you want to be known for? That's such a great question to be asking ourselves. And we're so busy with our to-do list, we often forget to ask it. So I will take some questions. But if you want to reach me, this is how you can find me. I want to invite you to be more discoverable this year. I want you to help other team members and colleagues to be more discoverable. And if I can help you or your team to be more influential, to make that journey from leader to thought leader, this is what I do. I get to work with amazing people, many of them women leaders, and their teams who are really making that journey and helping them to think through what are all the strategies they can use? How can they be more effective and be more efficient at it? 
And if you send me a note to denise at thoughtleadershiplab.com, denise at thoughtleadershiplab.com, I will send you a, a secret page on my website which has a whole set of worksheets which go with the book. Because I really believe that there is some, some very basic steps that you can take, but sometimes taking them from just reading a book can feel overwhelming. The book is written as a seven-step process with a ton of resources and questions to ask yourself, but the worksheets are sort of an adjunct to that. All right, so happy to take a few questions. I know we're running up against time, but who has a question for me? How yeah. long does it take? Yeah, how long it takes to from a uh, different from level to, to the author leader. leader. Yeah. yeah, I wish I could say, oh, about a week. <laughs> it's all done. Honestly, everybody takes a little different path, and everybody takes a little different timeline. For me, it was really in a year, because it was kind of, I was the go-to girl. I was one of three or four people in the United States who knew anything about a topic in the middle of the dot-com craze, and it was the hot topic, and everybody wanted someone to talk to. We had an organization. We were doing interesting things. We were out showcasing women entrepreneurs, and so that's why I got this opportunity. And really kind of over the next year after the conference, just whew, kind of got, went everywhere. Others of my clients have taken definitely longer than that. You know, for Vaughn, it was three years from beginning to getting her headhunted to the job at the chancellor's office. From absolute zero, a brand new job, no team, no resources, nothing, to being headhunted. That was three years. So everybody's different. And by the way, it doesn't really, to me, it's not so much about the time it takes, but the impact you have along the way. You know, so much of this is about figuring out how am I going to measure my success? Am I measuring it by my followership? Am I measuring it by people adopting my ideas? Am I measuring it by just feeling more career satisfaction, which you mentioned? Do I just feel more like I'm leaving that legacy that I want to leave? That kind of measurement stick is a little different than just a timeline. I imagine to be a really good and diligent thought leader that you have to be able to take a lot of bumps and bruises along the yeah. way and a lot of resilience and have a lot of perseverance. So I'm just interested to hear um, uh, that to me, I feel like is sometimes where I hesitate. Like, do I want sure. to take all the bumps and bruises Absolutely. coming? Um, so I'm curious to know your approach when those come yeah. along the road. Yeah, there's arrows. There are definitely arrows that come our way. And, but here's the thing that's so fascinating to me. Usually in our mind, they're way bigger than the actuality. All the different people that I've worked with over the eight years I've been doing this work, there have been arrows. I'm not going to kid you, but usually we imagine them to be way bigger and we stop ourselves because we think that's going to happen. And yet, what we find is when we do hit a bump in the road, I'm not, I'm not saying we don't have them. I had one client who you know, put out a, a post that really wasn't well researched and got some real pushback on, you don't have the facts. But being able to clarify and, and build, rebuild the credentials after that and the credibility after that by owning it up. The truth is, like anything, innovation is about making mistakes. Innovation is about bumps in the roads and, and overcoming those bumps. And by having a community or having someone else next to you to lean on, I, I highly recommend that. <laughs> you know, that definitely helps. And then lastly, I, I would say that there's this, this great quote by a guy named Hank Lieber that I put in the book. And he, and he talks about, you know, there really is no such thing as failure. He says, failure is if you keep doing the same mistake over and over and over. Otherwise, it's just learning. And we all want to keep learning, so keep going which I think is just a very powerful reframe of this. Yes, people are going to bump into me and they're going to, going to question me and doubt me. But the more I can keep going and learning from that, the stronger I get. As one of the women I interviewed in the book said, you have to get ready for when you're not ready. Because we're not ready, right? We weren't ready for the job we have right now, were you? Right? We're not. But picking ourselves up, brushing ourselves off, and keep going. But thank you all for being here, and thank you for playing with me today. I really appreciate it.